Ladies and gentlemen on the Shred Gaming Zeta.com video, we're going to be discussing the final parts of my interview with Robert Halleck, who of course is the Technical Communications Desktop Gaming and Graphics over at AMD. So this part is going to be relatively short. These are basically some questions that I couldn't quite make into the last part of the interview um, just because of scheduling and so forth. He came back to me with these answers a little bit later. I do have some more questions um, regarding HSA, APUs and CPUs, but unfortunately he's not able to answer those because they're not his forte. He deals m predominantly with the graphics side of things and therefore I'm going to have to wait until the end of this month slash early next when all of the team is available and then I'll actually have access to them so I can uh, uh, ask them the relevant questions. So as I said, there's just uh, five or six questions in this, and then we'll just blast through it. I'll also have it, of course, as in a as a uh, written um, uh, written article on the website, so you can check that out using the corresponding link in the video's description. So anyway, um, first question I asked was, could you offer any comments regarding FreeSync technology and how it functions? Now. He's saying that he's going to get back to me on this. He said, and I quote, I'll have to get back with you soon. We've only just made the announcement CS, and I have a little bit to learn about the technology myself. Um, out of quote for a second, it seems that AMD is still fine-tuning this, specifically to do with monitors. You can check out a recent article I've done, if, you're, if you so wish. But the basic gist of it is it really depends on the monitor because of the different connection between laptop and traditional desktop monitors yeah there's a good possibility that you're connecting your monitor either via say a HDMI or a DVI connection and basically it uses a um, V-blank signal and manipulates the refresh rate via that it's quite complicated um, and as far as I understand it AMD are still basically fine-tuning it for the desktop so I'm assuming as soon as they have a little bit more information on that obviously the technology has just been announced they'll get back to me so anyway um, what about Mantle's performance so during CES they mentioned that Mantle um, with Battlefield 4 was about 45% extra in performance so I asked them will this sort of performance boost be indicative will it be normal for titles under Mantle uh, because if so I mean <laughs> I don't think it's really a bias to say that's incredible performance boost. I mean, it really is. To put that in... I mean, just think of the frame rate differences. Let's say you're getting 40 frames a second, and someone says to you, okay, well, we're going to give you 30 to 45%. Let's just throw numbers out. Extra performance on, like, 40. That, that suddenly means that basically you're going to be playing at, you know, around the 60 frames per second mark, which is incredible. Um... And I say this, as I said before, I'm a GeForce owner, but I, I really love the ideas of Mantle. I think it fixes a lot of issues which are prevalent in PCs right now. Um, anyway, I'm going to get on with Robert's reply. He said, every game is different, of course, but we've said all along that we didn't undertake the Mantle project to take chase just 2-3% to performance improvement. So each game will be publishing a full set of data, and we're confident people will be pleased with the uplift. Now... I'm really hoping, obviously they're still working on Mantle, uh, this is out of quote, they're still working on Mantle with games developers and that API is going to continue to improve and evolve with the driver set, but even if it's 20% as a, like a median between games, that's pretty decent. And it's definitely going to be an interesting battle from the perspective of NVIDIA and AMD, because games which support this the mantle technology I refer to, it's going to be very interesting because, you know, games um, right now, it's like, you know, you're going to see a small performance difference. Um, I've used the example of Tomb Raider before, but certainly that's not the only game. Some games are just better just because of how the technology works on that particular game or game engine. It works slightly better for AMD, or it might work slightly better for NVIDIA. But if we can start seeing Mantle work like this, I, I wouldn't be surprised if um, NVIDIA are really contemplating doing their own version of Mantle or maybe incorporating AMD's Mantle technology. Anyway, um, another question I asked... 
regards a follow-up to the previous performance question. So I've said, I've noticed that AMD are very generous with their ROP count for their GPUs. For example, the R9 range has more ROPs than, um, than the previous generation and the com competitors and how many ROPs and texture units are required for the resolution of 1080p and 60 frames per second and 1440p. So I'm going to go into why I'm asking these specific questions, but in a different video, um, because it, it, it's kind of like a loaded thing, uh, as it turns out, but I'm certain people might understand it. All right, that's all I'm going to say. But anyway, I'm going to go with Robert's reply. Um, I think it's I think it's easiest to look at the hardware we already offer. For example, as they're demonstrating what we think is ideal hardware configurations to specific performance targets um, within this generation of gaming. For example, the R9 270X is a card we make specifically for 1080p gaming that has 32 ROPs and 80 text units. Now, just for a second, this is going to be out of quote. I'm going to tell you the guys the specifications of that. I will write this down in the article. Anyway, a really brief overview of the specifications of this. Um, it has 1280 stream processors and runs with 1000 megahertz core clock with um, a memory clock of 5.6 gigahertz. That's a GDDR5 memory on a 256 bit bus, by the way. So then, if you were to go up slightly to the R9 280, uh, this is Robert's quote, this is our product specifically designed for 1440p, and you'll find that it's 32 slash 128. So once again, that's 32 ROPs uh, slash 128 configuration. But I do want to emphasize these figures of today's GCN architecture it may not be true for the hat, so don't hang your head, uh, don't hang your hat on this in like five years down the road. So basically, just to clarify, He's stating that for gaming right now, uh, for 1080p at 60, on average, depending obviously on the optimizations of the title, you're really looking at 32 ROPs and 80 text units. So anyway, I'm going to go into the why I'm asking those questions in a different video because it's quite a long, complicated um, and somewhat off-topic uh, discussion. But anyway... Um, Next question, do you feel that the Steam machines, oh by the way guys I forgot to mention, this is a follow up question to the previous part of the interview, so if you're unfamiliar with what I said last time then you can check that out, that's a whole other set of topics and answers. So, um, Do you feel that Steam machines being pre-configured and ready to go will help the PC game market? One of the com common complaints that I get from friends is that PC gaming is more complex. I do know that AMD are also trying to tackle this, however, um, and as well as NVIDIA, by the way. Now, this has been an issue that I hear quite frequently. This is out of my interview quote, but still. If you're a PC gamer and you've ever tried to get friends who are typically console gamers into gaming on a PC, there's a few really bad preconceptions. The first is that it's more difficult, right? the configuration's harder, the, you know, the buying process is harder, which now, you know, back in the day, I'm talking like, certainly pre-Steam, but, uh, well, let me rephrase, before Steam was good, right, because to begin with early Steam, not so good, I'll just be blunt, but recently, Steam, applications like the GeForce Experience and so on, have helped us a lot. Right, you get less issues with IRQ conflicts, and sure, some games, you know, you might have a little bug, um, but console gaming is not exactly completely bug-free now. That's the problem. Um, anyway, I'm going to get on with his answer. Uh, sure, we're trying to tackle this. Um, for example, with the AMD Gaming Evolved app powered by Raptor, it doesn't necessarily simplify the process of building a gaming PC, but we're trying to take the legwork out optimizing a game and getting it running smoothly by crowdsourcing a load of data for users, then making that available to them in the form of a one-click optimization. As for Steam Machines, the biggest appeal, in my own opinion, is uh, Valve and Steam of a prestigious name in our industry, deservedly so, and I think it's a wonderful... It's wonderful using Valve for this prestige to make PC gaming more accessible. Um, end quote. And this has been something that's been on the forefront of my mind for a long, long time. Um, 
I think that the Steam machines, the pre-configurations with, say, the GeForce Experience or, in their case, the Gaming Evolved app, they really help because if you're someone like myself or possibly yourself, you know, most likely yourself if you're watching my channel, um, there's a good chance that you know what resolution's going to work, yeah? You, you know what you know, what settings are going to roughly do what to the frame rate. You know roughly the rig you've got. You know, okay, well, you know, I need to upgrade my graphics card, but I'm waiting for the next generation. My my card's a bit old, so you know what, I'm just going to turn down anti-aliasing and maybe, I don't know, the lighting effects. Just whatever. Um, but certainly... You know that stuff, and it, it's not a problem for you to configure it. You could probably configure the options in just a few seconds, even advanced ones. I certainly do, you know, I just go through them, blah. But I have friends who try to game on PC or, you know, whatever, and they get the basics. They know that, obviously, if you turn up settings higher, then it's going to slow down the game, but they really struggle on it. Not, I don't mean that in a derogatory sense. I just mean that it takes them longer, and they find it a bit more fiddly, maybe, than what they should. But this is just good. You click on it. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get the optimal settings for your gameplay style, but it's certainly, if you're just interested in a simple click, and that's it, then it's good. You know, that still means that... If you're like myself, or possibly yourself, and you really want to go in there, get the most out of your game, maybe do a little bit of overclocking, then you could do so. But I like the idea of these applications, and I really like the idea of Steam Machines because of this as well, because they're going to be pre-configured to run certain games, and I, I quite like that. Anyway, so what about the PCIe bandwidth and latency? I've seen numerous comparisons that show PCI bandwidth is cu isn't currently fat saturated on a PCIe 3 bus. And on high-end graphics card, we're currently seeing very little performance dip between PCIe 3 and 2. Given how XDMA works with the Crossfire, uh, out of quote for a second, this is removal of the Crossfire bridge between the two gra graphics cards. For example, on the, on, um, on the Radeon 7970, basically there was a a bridge, like a, a ribbon cable, as you can consider it, between the two cards, and that would share the data between the two cards. Basically, AMD scrapped this because they noticed that it was giving them issues regarding frame rate pacing. This is one of the ways they did this. It's not. It's now working all through the bus or the bus. So anyway, I asked him specifically, how much of bottleneck does PCIe bus pose for GPU compute and high uh, graphics performance in terms of latency and bandwidth? And he replied in an independent analysis. Uh, um, such tests a very small but noticeable different fallout for the demonstrated on PCI 216 to a full bore compute scenarios with multiple GPUs. The same could not be replicated for gaming scenarios. Even so, I would argue that PCIe is not bottlenecking at all at the moment. Anyway, and then he just uh, obviously uh, issued thanks for the interview and such, and um, that was pretty much it. So hopefully you guys have enjoyed this final part. I know I did promise it a couple of days ago, but it's just been ridiculously swamped for me the last few days, if I'm totally honest. I'm trying to get back on top of things, because obviously I had my plague with the flu, and um, well not flu, but certainly a not very pleasant cold and everything else, so... Getting back on top of things and trying to get some more interviews with some people. Um, it's going okay at the moment. I have a few in the lot works. Obviously, AMD, I'm going to be getting some more interviews from them from the end of the month, which is fantastic. So I'll see you guys soon. Hopefully you enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.